mix it up, introduce yourself to somebody you've hardly met, and ask them what their favorite color is today. Blue. Well, it's great to be back with you all this morning in the house of the Lord. We're going to have a great time today in, the, in Yeshua. Well, welcome back, Mishpacha family, to the Tree of Life. Thank you for attending our Shabbat service this morning. We trust every single week that your experience with us is a positive one, it's a memorable one. Some of you have a lot of questions. We'll do our best as a loving community to hopefully try and answer those questions. We open our service as many traditional synagogues, many other messianic synagogues open the service with this beautiful prayer out of the book of Psalms, the book of Numbers. The Matovu prayer is recited upon entering the synagogue, and it's taken again from Psalms in the book of Numbers as well. It starts with the words of Balaam. A prophet sent by Balak, the king of Moab, actually to curse the tribes of Israel. But when Balaam saw the people of Israel dwelling in peace and safety and security, God changed his intention of cursing our people. And out of his mouth came these beautiful words of praise. Please join me. It'll be on the screen as well. Ma tovu. O Halecha Yaakov, Mishkenotecha Yisrael. Oh, how goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. Lord, we we love your house and your honor's dwelling place. And we ask you, Lord, would you answer each and every one of us here today with Yeshua, with your true and only salvation? Lord, we count on that promise. We count on it for our lives and for our families' lives. In the name of your son, Yeshua. Amen. 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 Well, if we have any kids here yet today, I know... A uh, number of them come a little bit later, but we do. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. All right. This is a tradition as well. It's a beautiful tradition in Israel when our people return home from the synagogue to bless our children. Come on up. Yeah. As they head off a little bit later after worship to their own Shabbat school classes where they get filled up with the word just like we do here. And so extend your arms toward them as we pray this biblical prayer from Numbers 6 and 24 and forward. For the girls, Yisimech, Elohim, Ke Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Velea. May God make you girls like Sarah and Rebecca, Rachel and Leah, the blessed mothers of our people. And for the boys, Yisimcha, Elohim, Ke Ephraim, Vechim, and Ashe. May God make you boys like Ephraim and Manasseh, as you build Israel in your generation. Lord, we lift up this generation, the next Messianic evangelists, shepherds and teachers in the body of Messiah in this movement. Lord, anoint them, empower them, bring them joy and nachas today as they worship alongside of us in your presence and in their own Shabbat school classes. Anoint those teachers and those volunteers serving with them as well. Lord, bring more children here with parents in the days ahead. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, kids. We'll see you back at the end of the service. Enjoy yourself today here. The Shema is 
known as the Declaration of Our Faith. But before we do that, we want to open up the Ark of the Lord today, and I guess that has fallen to me. I don't know if I've ever done this in the last several years here. If you would stand as we open up the Ark of the Lord and as we process it through the congregation, it's our opportunity to express affection for the Lord's Word. We're not, you know, worshiping a scroll or anything like that. We are worshiping the author of the scroll, Adonainu. Our Lord. Let's recite these words as we open the ark today. Vaihibin soa haaron, vaiomer moshe, kuma adunai, futsu ho hivecha, vehanusu misanecha. Mi pane hecha ki mi tzion te tse he tohora ki mi tzion te tse he tohora ul devar adonai. Me Yerusha Lahayim Baruch Shenatan Torah Torah Baruch Shenatan Torah Torah Le Amo Yisrael Bihi kadu shato. Adon HaAdonim, Lord of Lords. The Shema is known as, you all know, is a declaration of worship. It's the affirmation of Judaism. 
And we recite it today with vigor. It's the Lord speaking to us since our response to him. Let's recite it from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and forward. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Boruch Shem Kivod Mahalachuto Leolam Va Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom, which is forever and ever. Amen. Amen. April? Amen. We'll continue standing as we continue our worship. We thank God that we are here, that we've made it through another week, that he has kept his hand on us. Amen.
you up this morning. There is no other name like your name. Your name is a strong tower. You are our redeemer. You are our all sufficiency. And we build our lives on your word because your word is truth and nothing can stand against it. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring.
of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
to those around me. Fill me with love for those, for those around me. I want to be a light unto the world. I want to be your love expression to the world. You're looking for men and women. You're looking for men and women whose hearts are firmly fixed on you. I want to be your expression of love to those around me.
see the walls. I see the walls, they're coming down, they're coming down, they're coming down. There is healing in the room. There's salvation in the room. The chains are being broken. The chains are being broken. There is healing in this room. There's salvation in this room. Just reach out, reach out and take it. It's yours for the taking. Take that step, take that leap, take that run of faith, just step in. There's nothing to hold you back. There's nothing to hold you back except you. Don't hold yourself back. It's time to let go. It's time to let loose. It's time to let go. There's freedom. There's freedom. Oh. lives to you 
oceans roar, you are the Lord of all, the one who calms the wind and waves and makes my heart be still. Though the earth gives way, the mountains move into the seas, the nations rage, and no was taking a nap I was in control and I think he's in the same state of shalom that he was that day as the storm rose over the Kinneret it's up to us to have the peace of mind and know that God is in control the waves are raging for sure 
storm is raging, but God, my God, our God is in control. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated this morning with your fine selves. Thank you, April and Vicki. I'm not sure how all that sound comes out of two women in their instruments, but I'm grateful for it. If you have your Bibles this morning, our kids can be dismissed. You can turn on the app, the Tree of Life app, and open up this morning to the Torah in Deuteronomy chapter 31. And one verse here, verse 20. Moses writes, For when I bring them to the land flowing with milk and honey, that I swore to their fathers, and they eat and are satisfied and grow fat, Unfortunately, then they will turn to other gods and serve them, and they will spurn me and break my brit, my covenant. Prolonged prosperity, even for the maturest of us, can gradually produce a self-reliant spirit, a rebellious spirit, even a backslidden life that eventually, eventually going forward in that spirit will Yield God's corrective and painful discipline. How many of you have received discipline by the Lord? So how do we live with this blessing of prosperity and avoid self-reliance? Well, very simply, my friends, we spend time every day in the Word of God and his, where His Spirit can help us cultivate this humble and thankful attitude. I'm thankful you're here this morning. If this is your first or second time, with us. I want to thank you for coming. I want to put a free a book into your hands that will give you a, a crisp and clear call of what we do, why we do, our mission and our vision. Anybody here uh, that needs a copy of the fig tree blossoms this morning? Well, that's okay. All right. Looks like everybody's good on that. So let's go before the Lord. You can take out an offering envelope in front of your chair and let's go before him today. Elohevraham Yitzchak Yaakov, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. Elohevotenu, God of our forefathers, we come before you, Lord, recognizing that you are in control. And though in our lives the waters are raging and the waves are high, we know that we win with you in the end. So, Lord, it puts our soul at rest as we fight this good fight of faith in a lost and dying world. Lord, give us wisdom and give us prophetic insight. Give us the word on our lips and in our lives that those that come across our paths would see Yeshua in and through us. Do it, Lord. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys, for that. I'm going to ask Robert. I did not ask him before service, but I know he's in season and out of season. If you'd come up with your... So, we've been sharing about things happening in our state and in our county, and Robert's kind of been one of our guys, kind of on the tip with no fear and with courage in his life and in his heart and in his mind. And he let us know a couple of days ago about something coming up on Tuesday. Would you share that with us and encourage us that those who would have the time or make the time to come out there and join with you? Okay, yeah. So um, this coming Tuesday, the County Board of Supervisors is um, um, having uh, a meeting that's open to the public. It starts at 9 o'clock in the morning, but uh, it's agenda item number 11. So some People from Reopen San Diego are projecting that that agenda item might only start somewhere around 1 o'clock, maybe 2 o'clock. But they do have a, also an opportunity in the morning at 9 o'clock, if you're there before 9 o'clock, to speak on non-agenda items. You can have two minutes to address the board and let them know what you think. Um, I did this back in September when there was a, a proclamation that they voted on to... Um, make San Diego a, uh, basically a, a, an abortion haven. And a lot of people came there to protest it. 
the board basically ignored the public outcry. There was uh, 90, uh, 89 people that said they were against it and four people that were for it, and the board still voted for this proclamation. Didn't have any legal implications, but it basically you know, sends, a, sends a negative message. Well, um, this, uh, I guess it was a, I'm not exactly sure, a couple meetings ago, uh, uh, Nathan Fletcher snuck in an off-agenda item about mandating uh, COVID vaccine for all county employees. And because it was not an agenda item, um, one of the ladies from Reopen San Diego actually brought up that there was a violation of the Brown Act, and so they are, uh, which you know, requires open meetings and, and, and properly agenda itemed uh, uh, votes. So, so, so they are rehearing it, or they're, they're re-voting on it on Tuesday. So come out and make your voice heard loud and clear. The more people that they see coming to these meetings and speaking out against their nonsense, eventually we're gonna, we're gonna wear them down. The last mm -hmm. time I was there, I actually, um, they, they, uh, should I share more? Yeah, so um, the last time I was there, they opened the session in prayer and I had the opportunity when it was my turn to speak, said, I appreciate you guys actually starting in prayer. I like that. But you know, there's a, come, it comes a time when they can mimic or you know, they can speak that they've got God on their side. But if they're not following God's will, they need to hear, if this is not God's will, you need to, you need to step down. And I think that we need to keep pounding on them. Tuesdays, 9 o'clock, open mic, basically two minutes uh, for non-agenda items. Uh, if you want to talk on an agenda item, they, they'll, they'll have to call you in order or you know, groups of five or something like that. And it's gonna, it, I would say either come in the morning or come in the afternoon. So I think Joel wanted me to speak because I'm wearing my, my protest badge. For those of you who can see it, who can't read it, it says no vaccine question mark you must wear this. And this is where it's going, folks. It's the same thing that happened in Nazi Germany um, 80 years ago, 90 years ago. It started with, hey, there's a group of people that are diseased, and they became outcasts from society. It's us. That's the group that they were pointing out, Jews. They made them start wearing these badges to differentiate them because, oh, you know, you didn't want to be too close to a Jew. Now they're saying, hey, don't get too close to someone that's not been vaccinated because they've got natural immunity or they haven't been exposed to this bioweapon. Now, I had this bioweapon a month ago. I mean, I got exposed to it and I got sick and it was terrible. I, I don't want, I don't wish anyone to have this, but if you have natural immunity, there's no reason to have a vaccine. That's right, amen. Amen. So, so that's my message for next Tuesday. Come out, join, join us. And uh, so apparently, you know, reopen San Diego was um, really on the forefront of this. I, I finally, after getting met their, their emails forwarded to me, <laughs> I actually finally joined their list. And it's, that's why I can, you know, speak more, more recently on what's going on. Amen. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate you. I want to encourage you as well, um, those of you who have been participating in 40 Days for Life, we're going to finish that campaign up tomorrow. They asked me once again, I'm not sure why, they could ask hundreds of pastors in this town to speak. So I'm going to be speaking at this at 5 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, there will be a Catholic priest, a Jewish rabbi, the Knights of Columbus on All Hallows Eve. It sounds like a joke, but I'm going to encourage you as well, along with Robert for Tuesday, come on out. If you've never had an opportunity over the last couple of campaigns and you still want to pray uh, outside of Planned Parenthood, we're going to have a closing ceremony and a time of prayer and a time to encourage your faith in standing biblically on this issue. I wanted to, uh, guys, if you can just cue up that video. Uh, you know, I've shared with you over the years, my family, we are... We've been sold out to the Lord in this movement for decades, and we enjoy serving God. And the Lord has brought us on a really a great journey, starting in business, moving uh, into ministry, and combining both at times. And I have an Israeli part of my family, my brother and my sister-in-law and their children, 
live in Israel, and, and as you know, they have a Messianic congregation in the center, the north center of the country in Benyamina. The name of their Messianic synagogue is Sha'ari Tehillah, Gates of Praise. It's a strictly Hebrew-speaking congregation. They went fully Hebrew several years ago. They lost some Anglo speakers, uh, but they just felt like this is an indigenous movement in Israel. We need to be speaking Hebrew. So they have quite a cadre of millennials, Gen Y and Gen Z, but they're also, the Lord's given them a heart, not just for our people in Israel, uh, but for our Arab brothers and sisters as well. So guys, if you would, this is an interview that was done this week on CBN uh, with my sister-in-law, who many of you know, Sarah Lieberman. Some of the songs we sing, uh, she uh, has composed what the Lord has given her. So guys, maybe we can dim the lights and, and uh, show that video. Sarah Lieberman is an Israeli worship leader, songwriter, and speaker. She's devoted her ministry to spreading the gospel through worship. After she suffered an untreatable ear injury, she entered a season of pain and desperation. During this difficult time, she was inspired to start The Invitation, an organization that reaches people in the Arab world through songs translated in their language. Living as a Christian in Israel, Sarah's heart is for the nations of the Middle East. Sarah Lieberman joins us live all the way from Jerusalem. Sarah, welcome to 700 Club Interactive. Thank you, Terry. It's great to be here. Sarah, you've dedicated your life to worship in the Middle East and around the world. When did you know that God had called you to be a worship leader? You know, Terry, when I grew up, I had a vision of multitudes of people, myriad of people worshiping God. And I didn't understand what that was. And I turned to a career in business uh, and uh, achievement. And uh, one day God decided to touch my life and he called me back to his original dream, his design for me. And he asked me if I would go into the world and spread his name and glorify him. And through that, that people's lives would be changed and transformed. You and your husband began holding what you call grassroots meetings during the pandemic. Tell me what God started doing in that time. You know, it's very interesting because this pandemic really uh, could have signaled a shrinking back of the body around the world and also in this country. But what God did for us was actually ask us to start a new community where we live uh, close to the ocean in the northern part of Israel. And he started to bring young Israelis to faith, uh, something that I hadn't seen growing up here in my whole life. And uh, today we have the privilege of discipling them and walking through through uh, the battles that they're walking through. You know, they suffer from persecution and, and, and opposition uh, it, from their families and, and from their surroundings. But God uh, gave us this model of this one-on-one -on -one discipleship that we're doing with them. And so we were never shut down and we were never closed during the pandemic. And in fact, God began to save more and more people. And uh, through this last uh, year and a half, we are actually seeing a springing up, a growing of these groups and this work here in Israel. Well, one of the things that has happened to you over the last few years is you've had an untreatable ear injury and that led to an encounter with God. What did he tell you? You know, what happened was uh, I had been leading worship and traveling uh, the world, singing, uh, and when this ear injury happened, everything stopped and everything shut down for me. And uh, when you go through something like that, you can question your identity, your identity in God. And uh, after a season of wilderness and, and soul searching, I decided to ask God a question that changed everything for me. And I said, I don't want to do what's on my heart. I want to do what's on your heart. Could you tell me what is on your heart? And instantly God showed me the globe. He showed me the earth and he showed me the Middle East region. And I thought, I'm a young Israeli Jewish girl. What in the world could I do? Um, by the way, I was really bad at Arabic at school as well. So, uh, you know, what could I do to bless the people that God wanted to bless? And he showed me that my namesake, Sarah, in the Bible, you know, she suffered from something that a lot of us, uh, we do. It's a human condition that we have moments where we don't trust God's word or we, we, we lack the faith to hold on to it. Uh, and through that, she, together with Abraham, you know, they cast out Ishmael and, and Hagar from, from the house of the father, from Abraham's tent. And that 
uh, is what God wants to change and reverse. And he asked me if I would go in the name of Sarah, and uh, that's how the Invitation Project was birthed, to call back the sons and daughters of Abraham, of Ishmael, uh, to come back to the family tent, to come back home. It's kind of like the prodigal son story, where the father is waiting with open arms. And I believe, too, that uh, by sending us from here, from Israel, which is something that's never been done before, with a message that's never been heard from Israel, that the sons and daughters of Isaac will be calling back the sons and daughters of Ishmael to the Lord, that one day those sons and daughters of Ishmael will come and call back the sons of daughters of Isaac. You have another program that you lead called the 1000 Project Sponsorship. What's that about? You know, God uh, wants to reach people, and a lot of times uh, in this region, uh, people don't like to have conversations about Jesus, about Yeshua, about God, He, uh, and they don't like necessarily, they wouldn't be invited to go to a congregation or enter a church. But uh, in the Middle East, you know, you can cut through a lot of boundaries with food, football, and music. And so we decided that we were going to use uh, music to reach the lost and reach the, the people who we could get to. And so uh, we have people who sponsor uh, this music and this work from all over the world that allow us to give this music for free to people who are not yet believers. You have the unique experience of living in community with both Jews and Arabs. What do you want people watching at home right now to know about that? What's it really like? I want people to know that God's transformational work in our lives means that it's not just slogans or just verses that you read in the Bible, that you can truly live a real brother and sister life with young Arab believers and Jewish believers in the whole region and in this country in particular. You know, my greatest helpers in the Invitation Project are young Arab uh, believers here, worshipers in Israel, and then God is also connecting us to young worshipers uh, it, who speak Aramaic. Uh, uh, we're translating the songs into Kurdish right now. Uh, we're going into Urdu, uh, Farsi, another one. None of this would be possible in my power or, or in Israel's power. It's only possible through the fact that Jesus breaks down that wall of partition. Mm -hmm. But I want people to know that it's real. It's alive and real today in Israel. And this is something that signals to the earth the coming of the king. Wow. We're all, we're all looking forward to that, Sarah. God bless you in the work that you're doing. It's wonderful to see somebody who's able to have a foot in both camps and then bring those camps together. We, we bless your work. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much. Well, we want you to know you can learn more about Sarah, about her ministry by visiting sarahlieberman.com. On her website, you can also join the movement to bring the gospel to Jews and Arabs around the world through projects like The Invitation and The 1000 Project Sponsorship. In addition, you can find albums and merchandise there to encourage you in your own walk with God. Just thinking of... Thinking of Victor, I don't know if I see Victor. I know he was in here a little bit earlier, but uh, he'll be encouraged by that as well. Hanukkah is coming up. My goodness, it's just about a month away. And we want to bless our kids with some gifts. And so be thinking about that as uh, we come to you in the month of November uh, with some Hanukkah gift project for our kids. And, 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 and uh, be back here next Shabbat. We want to bless one of our uh, families. Uh, Catherine Hasselbring is having a baby boy with... Craig and their kids, and so we want to bless you real good. So uh, I'm sure you have the flyer on that. I'll be directly following the service next Shabbat. Do you bring your Bibles today? We're going to have some great time in the Word of God today. I'm excited about preaching today. I've got a, like a runway here. It's like kind of a And it's great to see them back. It's great to see everybody back that's been going through this as well. God is a restorer of broken things. So, 
This morning, as we continue in our extended study in the Gospel according to Luke, I'd like to examine a two-round theological boxing match in the Scriptures between Israel's leading scholars and the carpenter from Nazareth. In the first half of this passage we want to take up this morning, the Jewish authorities attempt to implicate Spies who pretended to be righteous in order to trap him in his words. And it was a $1,000 game, $1,000 prize. Whoever had bingo had to stand up and shout, show me the money. Guess what, folks? B75, that was me. Show me the money. I won 1000 bucks. And then about a month later, I got a 1099 <laughs> from the cruise line. True story. I had to pay taxes. It wasn't 1000 but. But what's wrong with this picture in the scriptures? What's wrong is that the spies, you'll have to look over to Mark's account of this to see that the spies were the Pilashim, the Pharisees, and the Herodians in Mark chapter 12, which I'm going to be assuming here in this message that these were the spies here in this account. These two, the Herodians and the Pharisees, were joining forces against Yeshua. Now, the irony of this new alliance should not be overlooked, my friends. It'd be like the KKK joining forces with the NAACP. laws and traditions of Judaism. They were the most popular party with the masses. Most likely the masses respected them as a repository of Jewish wisdom, law, and tradition. Nevertheless, it is unlikely that the masses observed the particulars of Pharisaic sectarian rules. 
It is quite possible for the people to respect and admire their leaders, yet also resent them. Uh, Jacob Neusner suggests that Hillel guided the Pharisees out of power during the time of Herod and turned them into a purely religious sect. They returned to politics only after the destruction of the temple. Unlike the Essenes, the Pharisees lived among the people, working at their occupations, living in the towns, and attending the synagogues. They distinguished themselves only by their sectarian rules. Those rules concerned ritual purity, care in tithing agricultural produce, eating only kosher food, keeping the Sabbath according to their traditions, and marrying only women who fit their rules of pure descent. They had a vision for all Israel, a vision so powerful that it generated the religion of rabbinic Judaism, which has survived through good times and bad. The Pharisees took literally the words of Exodus 19, 5 and 6, quote, You shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. The Pharisees tried to realize this vision by living as if they were priests. Like priests, they ate every meal in ritual purity. Like priests, they studied Torah. So that's from a reform rabbi's perspective. Uh, those of you who like uh, studying from study Bibles, here's some more information. This one's from the Open Bible, which is one of my favorite study Bibles. It's not really a study Bible. It's really just a great reference Bible. Uh, and the article on the Pharisee says this. The word Pharisee means separated one. And the name probably meant in the first instance the one who had separated himself from the corrupting influence of Hellenism in his zeal for the biblical law. Pharisees were punctilious, you've just learned a new word, in observing the laws regarding ceremonial purity. For this reason, they could not purchase items of food or drink from a, quote, sinner for fear of ceremonial defilement. With a sincere desire to make the law workable within the changing culture of the Greco-Roman world, the Pharisees developed systems of tradition which sought to apply the law to a variety of circumstances. During the first century before Messiah, two influential Pharisaic teachers gave their names to two schools of legal thought. Hillel was the more moderate of the two, ever considerate of the poor and willing to accept Roman rule as compatible with Jewish orthodoxy. Shammai, on the other hand, was more strict in his interpretation and bitterly opposed to Rome. The Talmud preserves the record of 316 controversies between the schools of Hillel and Shammai. Tradition in Pharisaic thought began as a commentary on the Torah, but it was ultimately raised to the level of the Torah itself. To justify this teaching, it was maintained that, quote, the oral law was given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai along with the written law or the Torah, per a vote 1 1. The ultimate in this development is reached when the Mishnah states that oral law must be observed with greater stringency than the written law because oral tradition affects the life of the ordinary man more intimately than the more remote constitutional law, the written Torah. That's in Tractate Sanhedrin 10.3. Finally, men such as Nakdimon, Nicodemus, Yosef, Joseph of Arimathea, Gamaliel, and Saul of Tarsus represent some of the more noble souls from the Pharisaic tradition in the New, in the New Testament. So, assuming... Mark chapter 12, that it was the Pharisees and Herodians that were these spies here. The Herodians, by contrast to the Pharisees, were staunchly pro-Rome. They were the political party specifically appointed by the occupiers. My friends, what a strange sight it would have been when representatives from two opposing parties approached Yeshua with these questions. You see, among other things, it verifies the depth of the conflict with Yeshua's message that these two vastly different groups would now unify against the one claiming to be the Mashiach. And so since many of the Pharisees and the Herodians wanted to get rid of Yeshua, they demonstrated the old classic saying, my enemy's enemy is my friend. Now, at this point here in the conflict in this passage, we would not expect, as we've seen over the last several weeks especially, we wouldn't accept, expect sincere questioning of Yeshua. But I actually can see here how this question might have been sincere. You see, since Yeshua's message was, the central message was that the kingdom of God had arrived, a question about paying taxes to another kingdom, right, the Roman Empire, was fully a relevant question, wasn't it? 
Judeans began paying taxes to Rome in 6 CE or AD when Caesar Augustus terminated the rule of Archelaus, the son of Herod the Great, and made his territory a Roman province. Taxation was also a motivating factor in our people's revolt against Rome in 66 CE. But did you notice here that members of these two groups approach Yeshua under the cloak of flattery? They buttered him up, right? You're a man of integrity. You're a great teacher. My friends, flattery is not the same thing as true admiration. Flattery is patting someone on the back to find the soft spot to insert the dagger. Flattery is gossip in reverse. Gossip is saying something bad behind a person's back that you would never say uh, to him or her to their face. Flattery is saying something good to a person's face that you would never say behind your back. Flattery is mouth-to-mouth manipulation. And so after softening Yeshua up with a few short jabs of flattery, they slipped in the knockout question. Is it permitted in Torah to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And as soon as this question was asked, I can almost hear these groups laughing with glee. They were certain they had trapped Yeshua He had no room to escape, they thought. They thought it was a yes or a no question. If Yeshua said yes, all the people who expected the Messiah to liberate them from Rome would have deserted him. And if if the Pharisees, and then the Pharisees would then have an accusation, a major accusation against Yeshua as one who placed the pagan empire above obligation to God. On the other hand, if Yeshua answers no, Romans would have arrested him right on the spot. The Herodians would have had verifiable evidence of one who was advocating political rebellion. They thought they had this self-proclaimed Messiah painted into a corner in this boxing ring. No way out for him. However, since Yeshua is the divine Messiah... (laughs) He can and he did see through their disingenuous questions with the flattery. And so he knows their malicious intent. Even if the question was somewhat genuine, he sees the malicious intent. He gives them an answer that they could not have predicted. So what's his actual answer? Yeshua, who didn't even possess a coin, used to pay the tax, said to them, show me the money. And so as he held up this Roman silver denarius. It was a fair day's pay for a fair day's for a common laborer. He asked his own question. His question was, whose image, whose inscription does it have? The coin had the image of Emperor Tiberius Caesar stamped on it. The inscription on the flip side said in Latin, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus, himself now Augustus. In other words, the motto on the flip side of the coin proclaimed Tiberius to be the son of the divine Caesar who preceded him. Yeshua, the true son of God, would have recognized the irony of the claim of Tiberius on his coin. By the way, the coin itself was blasphemous to observant Jews because it bore that graven image of Tiberius violating the second commandment. And so Israel was circulating copper coins which bore the name but not the image of this deified emperor. And then Yeshua here gives his wise answer to a foolish question. He said, what? Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, right? And what? To God the things that are God's. Now that's actually a parable. Because Yeshua is taking one truth, pay the government what it's due, and beside it he lays down a parallel truth, give to God what is God's. Now, it must have really pleased the Herodians, right, to hear the first part of the statement, right? Give to Caesar that which is Caesar. But it must have shocked the Pharisees. But the second part of his answer certainly would have offended the Herodians while pleasing the Pharisees. You see, it's not an either or proposition. It's a both and, isn't it? Paying taxes and devoting oneself to God were both expressions of submission to God. 
And Yeshua's brilliant reply here teaches several lessons, I believe, for us today. Number one, if you're taking any notes. As followers of Yeshua, you and I hold dual citizenships, don't we? Dual citizenships. Yeshua used this occasion to teach the truth about citizenship, a truth which was both shocking and earth-shattering to the people of that day, earth-shaking to them because our Jewish people believed that the loyalty of a citizen belonged only to Adonai, but the rest of the world believed that loyalty belonged only to to the ruling monarch of their territory. And Yeshua astounded the world of his day here by declaring that there was an earthly, physical citizenship to which some things are to be given, and there was a spiritual, heavenly citizenship to which some things are to be given. Now, if we take those things separately, we have some false concepts of what citizenship is. The first false concept, on the one hand, is that Religion, let's say religion, is supreme. This was the view of the Pharisees. They believed strongly in the heavenly world, so much so that they believed that all obedience and loyalty were due Adonai and due Adonai alone. The state and all its power and its authority were to be subjected to religious rule. Therefore, they were strongly against paying taxes to a foreign king. Now, it seems to me that this concept of citizenship is still the same as it was in the days of Yeshua. I know many Yeshua followers who refuse to file income tax returns. Many. Now, on the other hand, the second false concept of citizenship we can learn here is that the state is supreme. This was the view of the Herodians who were not a religious party, but a political party of Herod, the king of Galilee. They were supportive of Rome, as I've mentioned, compromising whatever they could in order to preserve their own influence and power. They opposed all messianic claims because of the disturbance these claims would cause among the people. And they would agree the taxes must be paid to Caesar rather than to Adonai. So let me illustrate this lesson like this. Some people hold, and maybe some of you here hold, two or more passports. Why? Because you're citizens of more than one country. In this passage of Scripture, Yeshua reminds us that you and I hold dual citizenships. He said, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And by that statement, he indicated that all of us live in a relationship to an earthly government. Yeshua also said, give to God the things that are God's. In addition to our relationship to an earthly government, we must also consider our relationship with Adonai. Yeshua here clearly affirms that allegiance to Adonai takes precedence over everything else. And it is the first of the Ten Commandments. So if we are followers of Yeshua, we live in a relationship to Caesar relationship to the government, and with God. It's like holding two passports. And Paul points this out as well in the New Covenant. He was a Roman citizen, Paul was, which was a prized status in those days. But he realized not only was he a Roman citizen, he was a citizen of Shemayim, of heaven as well. Practical example of this, very simple. The U.S. has ambassadors in most all foreign countries. From 1778 until 1785, Benjamin Franklin served as our first ambassador to France. His job was to do what? To represent the United States in France. He actually had a home in Paris, but he never felt at home in Paris. I'm not sure why he didn't feel at home there. We've, I've been. It's incredible. But why? Because he knew his, home, his real home was in America. And in the same way you and I are ambassadors... For Messiah, we have been charged to represent the best of heaven. And as you and I live here on planet Earth, we are citizens of an earthly country. But if we're honest, we're never feeling really at home here. So let's talk about our dual citizenship. If we're an American citizen, we have a responsibility to our government and a responsibility to God. The scriptures teach... That number two, the second lesson from Yeshua's brilliant reply here, is that we must honor and obey the authorities that govern us. Now, this part is difficult to teach. 
The New King James Version says it like this. Render, therefore, to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. The Greek translation, or the best translation, is give it back. Because Rome minted and distributed the coins, it's proper to give them back to Rome. I actually thought for about two seconds, how many of you got the stimulus check this week? Anybody? Last week? You haven't gotten it yet? Oh, look in your direct deposit. Look in the mail. It's coming, friends. But I thought for about two seconds, man, should I just send that thing back? I don't want to go into more debt. And then that washed over me, and I said, we need the money, and I, and I need some things, you know. Paid off my wife's car, and I had to, yeah. But anyway, because Rome minted the coins and distributed it, it's proper to give them back to Rome. Now, when I pull out this quarter, we could ask the same question, right? Whose image is on the coin? Thank you. Boy, I was hoping somebody would answer that. <laughs> Washington's, right? George Washington, although he is dead, how many of you really believe he's alive? I mean, we're, you know, we're into conspiracy theories a little bit at Tree of Life. <laughs> you know, I know JFK Jr. could still be alive. You know, it's possible, but this one probably won't be a great theory. But although he's dead, it would be proper for us to say, give back to Washington that which is Washington's. So because our government minted and distributed this coin, right, it's appropriate to give it back to them. Here's the principle. As Americans, we should submit to the authority of our government. Easy to preach, hard to do. Shaul writes this, Romans chapter 13, he says, Let every person submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist are put in place by God. For this reason you also pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants. You hear that, Nathan Fletcher? The authorities are God's servants, attending diligently to this very thing. For many of us, we may not like our government. Oh, you too? Oh, okay. Um, but, all right, I'm throwing out this quarter here. Who's going to get it? I don't, all right. But the Bible says Adonai orders governments. Where are you going with that quarter? Okay. Oh, she needs water. Okay, she needs water. Adonai orders governments and puts them in place. Remember, who was the authority when Paul wrote that in Romans 13? The vicious Brutal, Yeshua following, uh, Yeshua follower hating, Nero was emperor. All power and authority of every government comes from Adonai. You remember from studying John's gospel, Yochanan's gospel account, when Yeshua is standing right before Pontius Pilate on the day he was crucified. Pilate asked Yeshua all kinds of questions, right? Yeshua sits there silently, though, without giving him any answers. And as Scripture prophesied, he was, like a, he was like a lamb, silent before its shearers, right? But finally, in exasperation, Pilate says this, hey, you better answer me. Don't you know that I have the authority to crucify you or release you? <laughs> I love Yeshua's answer. I believe he looked square at Pilate with eyes blazing like fire as he said in a voice cool enough to freeze hell, you would have no authority over me if it hadn't been given to you from above. Well, that's a good word. John 19.10. That's where government gets its authority. Now, the question Yeshua followers usually ask today is this. Should I obey my government 100% of the time? Here's a good example to follow then. There's only two occasions when you may not choose to obey your government. If the government commands you to do something Adonai's word prohibits, you should obey Adonai. Or if the government forbids you to do something that God's word commands, like Assembling yourselves together. Then you should obey God. 
Oh, man, people were giving us so much grief for staying open much of the pandemic. Well, that's often called civil disobedience. And the reality is that there are usually negative consequences, though, to civil disobedience, frankly. We find in Acts chapter 5, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest in Jerusalem, commands Kepha and Yochanan, Peter and John, to not to preach about Yeshua anymore. But <laughs> they had marching orders from Yeshua to proclaim the good news to every creature. And so in verse 29 in Acts 5, they said what? We must obey God rather than men. They continued to preach Messiah. They were, now civil disobedience, there's some negative consequences. What happened? They were beaten, right? They were arrested. But after the beating, the scripture says they walked away with bleeding backs, quote, rejoicing that they were considered worthy to be dishonored in account of his name. And they kept on disobeying the authorities to preach the good news about Yeshua. Friends, we saw a glimpse of this over the past 18 months. Thank God some congregational leaders stood up, went to the Supreme Court, went to the Appeals Court, Superior Court, and they had to relent. And we, we stayed open. We could have been fined $1,000 every Shabbat had they known that a Jewish congregation meets in a mall. They didn't even know we were here. They're not looking for us here. We have two main obligations to our government. Number one, we're commanded in Scripture, here's the hard part, to pray for those in authority. That's why we are to pray regularly for our president. Oh, Lord. Really? Does it say that? Okay. Members of Congress, state leaders, local leaders. And number two, we should submit to the government. That means to obey the laws and recognize that the authority of those who maintain them. Now, when we look in the rearview mirror, a very simple uh, illustration, we see a police vehicle in a rearview mirror with flashing lights. First, number one, we hope that he or she is after someone else and that they'll go by us. That's what we pray. But if, we pull, if he pulls up or she pulls up right behind us, we pull over, right? Because the scripture says we're to submit to the government authorities. Now, what's overall, how can we sum this up? Our to be submitted in three words, pray, obey, and pay. The problem with this passage of Scripture here in Luke chapter 20 is that we often focus so much on what Yeshua said about rendering to Caesar what is Caesar's, but we miss the impact, I believe, of the main thing Yeshua was teaching when he said, and give back to God the things that are God's. And I believe the final lesson that he's teaching us here is that we can freely choose to honor, and we should freely choose to honor and obey God who made us. You see, when people there were looking at that silver denarius coin that Yeshua held up, they saw the image of Caesar because his image was stamped on it, right? My friends, where do we find God's image? We go back to the creation. Genesis 1.27, quote, And God created humankind in his own image, male and female, he created them. What do we owe Adonai? We owe him whatever has his image stamped upon it. That's all of humanity. We are to give him our lives. When Adonai created us in his image, it doesn't mean we necessarily look like Adonai, but it means that as God is a triune being, Father, Son, and Ruach HaKodesh, we are created as a triunity as well, body, soul, and spirit. None of us may look very godly, but we are made in his image. And because his image, like, the, like Caesar, was is stamped on us, we're to give him something greater than our money. We give him ourselves. So let me conclude round one of a two-round fight by saying that there's much dissatisfaction in our culture. Have you noticed? <laughs> People have bought into the idea somehow that wealth 
brings happiness and contentment. Several years ago, Fidelity Investments surveyed 1,012 millionaires. And the results of that study revealed that 46% of the participants in that study said they do not feel wealthy. These are millionaires. They're worried about their financial future. The average net worth of these millionaires, the 1,012 of them, was 3.5 million. The survey asked what number that they would have to attain before they felt wealthy and comfortable, and the average answer was $7.5 million. King Solomon realized this generations ago, and he says in the ESV, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity, Ecclesiastes 5.10. Now, we may not be dissatisfied millionaires, although I'm willing to take that shot if the Lord allows that, <laughs> like those 1,012 millionaires in that survey. We may not be that dissatisfied Arizona Cardinals receiver in Jerry Maguire. But you might be a dissatisfied high school dropout without a job today. The point is, what's the point? Dissatisfaction is no respecter of persons. But when we look to the scriptures, we find the antidote for dissatisfaction, my friends. It's a short seven-word formula found in 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. It says, now godliness with Contentment is great gain. Godliness, what does that mean? It just means living for the Lord, right? Godliness happens when you give to God what is God's. What is that? Your life, my life. And when we do that, we can find, and I hope you have, true contentment. Well, the Herodians and Pharisees could not have envisioned such a complete answer. We're truly amazed at the answer. They had no choice but to leave Yeshua. They went away to ponder their next move. In steps round two. Let's read it, verse 27. Then some of the Sadduqim, the Sadducees, who deny there is a resurrection came and questioned Yeshua. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies... Having a wife, but no children, then his brother should take the widow and father children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died childless, and the second and the third took her, but in the same way, each of the seven brothers died and left no children. Finally, the woman died too. So in the resurrection, they asked Yeshua, whose wife is she? For all seven had married her. Then Yeshua said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those considered worthy to reach the olam haba, the world to come, and the resurrection of the dead, neither marry nor are they given in marriage. For they can no longer die because they are like angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But at the burning bush, even Moses revealed that the dead are raised when he calls Adonai the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is God, not of the dead, but of the living. For to him, they are all living. And so this is, the, by the way, the only mention here in this whole gospel that we've been studying of the Tzadukim, the Sadducees, meaning the, quote, righteous ones. These were a small, influential group. This is a small, influential group in Jerusalem. They were the aristocrats, right? who were in charge of the temple worship in that first century CE. They were a priestly sect who, in one view, claimed descent from Zadok, the high priest under King David, 1 Kings chapter 1. You see, the high priest was always a Sadducee. They were much more liberal than the Pharisees, who were essentially, again, the Orthodox Jews in, for the synagogue community. The Sadducees, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in angels, they didn't believe in demons, they didn't believe in miracles, they didn't believe in an afterlife. They only accepted the Torah, the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, as divinely inspired. And so, while having respect for the prophets and respect for the writings, the Sadducees based their theology solely on the written Torah. Again, from uh, rabbi Stephen Weiland, reform rabbi, writes about the Sadducees this. He says, the Sadducees, again, were priestly and aristocratic. They came from the highest classes of society. They favored the Romans. They cooperated with them in ruling the country. They were not popular, though, with the masses. 
The Sadducees denied the divine origins of the oral law of the Pharisees. They did not believe in angels nor in bodily resurrection. They believed that death is final. The Sadducees did not believe in providence. They believed that God is utterly transcendent above all human concerns. God takes no interest in human deeds. God neither rewards nor punishes. This is the Sadducean view. The Sadducees had power because they controlled the temple. Their numbers were drawn from the chief priests. The high priests were generally Sadducees. Again, from quickly from the open Bible. It says this in the Sadducean section of this article. They were the party of the Jerusalem aristocracy, of the high priesthood. They had made their peace with the political rulers, had attained positions of wealth and influence. Temple administration and ritual were their specific responsibilities. They held themselves aloof from the masses. They were unpopular with them. They did not believe, again, in resurrection, spirits, or angels. The ESV study Bible says about them, Josephus claims they were unfriendly even to one another and were unpopular in his Jewish war and antiquities books. They could be cruel judges. James, Jacob, or Yaakov, the brother of the Lord, was later killed by a Sadducean high priest. The Sadducees rejected the extra-biblical traditions of the Pharisees, as I mentioned, uh, and so on. So, some representatives from this group, the Sadducees, they approach Yeshua, right, with a she'ilah, with a theological question. And true to form, they ask about a teaching from the Torah. And this was an important law in the Torah of leverit marriage. Leverit marriage. That was a vital protection to women in the Middle East. In the ancient Middle East. You see, in most societies, we know if a woman was widowed and childless, she was what, in danger, right, of her life. No outward means of support. And the Torah stipulated here in Deuteronomy 25, verse 5 and forward, that a man's family was then responsible to care for the widow through this arrangement of, lever, of leveret marriage. Now, how this worked is this way. If a married man died... Without a son, what happened? The next older brother would receive all of his property, which would include his wife. I'm not saying wife was property, but included his wife as well. The brother of the deceased was then obligated to marry his sister-in-law and try to have children. If her husband's brother, though, refused to do that, refused to marry her, she could spit in his face and take his sandals, and he would be publicly shamed. So most brothers obligated, or they obliged by marrying their brother's widow. Then if the wife had a son by her new husband, the son would then carry on the dead husband's name and claim his property. So far, so good, right? But there's a, a distinctive twist in this ludicrous hypothetical scenario here. It's crazy, really. There were seven brothers who at their own time had a certain woman for their wife until each brother died. This is a fabricated example, but it, if it really happened, you can imagine husbands number five, six, and seven, they weren't too happy about marrying her. They would have been thinking, what is wrong with her meatloaf? Something's amiss with husbands one through four. Again, as with the previous dialogue between the Pharisees and Herodians, the question is a calculated question, isn't it? How strange for some of these Sadducees to even mention the idea of resurrection. They don't believe it in their question. Yet after these Sadducees finished their ridiculous case study, I can imagine they were also laughing and smiling and glancing at the other Sadducees before they delivered their preposterous question to Yeshua. So <laughs> they're laughing in the resurrection. Whose wife is she? They're laughing about it. They don't believe in a resurrection. And so the example is so carefully worked out so that no brother has a special claim to the woman of each of the seven. And since neither the Pharisees nor Yeshua could reply that she would be the wife equally of all seven... The Sadducees believe this illustration refuted belief in the resurrection. Remember, these are priests. They are serving in the temple in Jerusalem. They were highly educated in so many areas. But their own theology, hear me, had created a blind spot in regard to the full revelation of God's truth. Since the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead is clearly taught in dozens of scriptures. Just not in the portion of scripture that they considered their canon. 
The Tzadukim were prone. They were known to pose these conundrums. You've just learned a second word. No, actually, you know, Darcy and I use that word all the time in our home. But anyway, they were known to pose these conundrums to the Pharisees, seeking to illustrate what they believed were the absurd implications of belief in a resurrection. Actually, if you've been married more than once, which is a lot of us, some of us in this room, it's a valid question, actually. If you've remarried due to death or you've remarried due to divorce, you may be wondering which mate will be yours in heaven. Relax. <laughs> Yeshua indicates that it doesn't matter in heaven. By the way, this biblical teaching contradicts an important doctrine that you'll find in Mormonism, by the way. That is of celestial marriage in Mormonism. Mormonism teaches if a couple is married in a Mormon temple, their marriage becomes a celestial marriage that will exist throughout all eternity. Mormons believe they can eventually establish and populate other worlds, such as this one, provided that they have a celestial marriage partner or partners with whom they can produce spirit children for the celestial kingdom. They believe the Mormon husband can become a heavenly father and his wife or wives a heavenly mother of millions of newly created souls. That's pretty recent. That's from a mid-1970s Mormon document entitled Achieving a Celestial Marriage out of Salt Lake City coming from the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But Yeshua said in heaven here, marriage is not the point. Yeshua's answer was simply to point out that the conditions of life in the Olam Haba, in the world to come, will be completely different from conditions in this life, as far as marriage is concerned. And as we think about heaven, as we think about Shemayim, I want to address several heaven questions with you today. And it's my desire, it's my prayer that you'll leave more excited about heaven than ever before. And that you will be more committed to go there and take as many people with you there as possible. Questions that we've thought about, I'm sure all of us. Number one, is heaven for real? Short answer, absolutely yes. Heaven appears over 600 times times in the scriptures. The word hell or Hades, Ades, only appear 22 times. Yeshua left us plenty of information to convince us that heaven is for real. He was the expert on heaven because he claimed actually that he came from heaven. Question number two, will we know our loved ones there? Absolutely. Absolutely yes. There are many passages indicating we, we will maintain a distinct identity in heaven. Remember the transfiguration. Yeshua recognized, right, Moses and Elijah. In response to this foolish question by the Tzadukim, realizing that quotes from the scrolls of Daniel or Isaiah or a lot of other places in the prophets and writings where the resurrection is mentioned would fall on deaf ears because they didn't consider that their canon Yeshua quotes a passage from their canon in the Torah that was central to their theology by referring here to Moses' experience at the burning bush, Exodus chapter 3. And by doing so, Yeshua delivers round two crushing counterpoint, uppercut. The very scriptures that they honored we see Adonai describing to Moses, Exodus 3, verses 4, 5, and 6, his relationship using the present tense. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. It's all in the tense of the verb. The way scripture speaks of our fathers, the patriarchs, indicated that they are still living years after they had passed from the scene. Yeshua is highlighting the fact of the resurrected, of the resurrection. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're still alive in heaven. They're experiencing life with God after their death and having their distinctive identities. The logical inference is pointed out by the Messiah Yeshua here. He says he is God, not of the dead, but of the living. And thus the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Elijah, Moses, etc., could look forward to the resurrection. Yeshua pointed out that the resurrection of the dead is taught in the Torah itself, and the Sadducees had erred. 
Now, contrary to public folklore, folks, when we die, we do not become angels. Sorry. Yeshua said we become here like the angels in that we will never die. I believe I've read every passage in the Bible about angels. And there is no reference to the birth of an angel or to an angel funeral. Contrary on February 14th to the Cupid myth, a myth, there is no reference in the scriptures to baby angels. There are no senior citizen angels. Angels are ruchi, ruchot, spirits, sent from Adonai to serve his people. Hebrews 11.4, 1.14 rather. They do not procreate. Angels do not need to replenish their numbers because they do not die. And here Yeshua adds that we will be like the angels in that we won't marry or we won't be given in marriage in heaven. The exact language Yeshua uses here is so important. He said, for when they rise up from the dead at the resurrection, they neither marry, verb, marry is a verb here, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, verb. In other words, there won't be any new marriage ceremonies in heaven. Current marriages won't be dissolved. So if you aren't married here on earth, here's a news flash. Don't expect to go to heaven and meet Mr. or Ms. Wright and ask them, will you marry me? Get her done here. Now, this does also not mean that people will be sexless, for they will have their own male or female immortal body in the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15. Scripture simply teaches us that resurrected people do not and need not marry to keep their race going, being like the angels who do not reproduce after their own kinds, as do humans. How many of you have ever thought about these things? I think about these things. I think a lot about heaven. I think I've thought about heaven more in the last 18 months than I've maybe ever. But what kind of bodies are we going to have in heaven? Ever thought about that? We'll have a transformed body, Baruch Hashem. We won't be spirits and we won't have physical bodies. Instead, we'll have a transformed body, which will be like the body of Yeshua after the resurrection. The emissary John says this, We shall be like him because we will see him just as he is. 1 John 3, verse 2. Yeshua had a real body, did he not, after the resurrection? His body could be touched, he could eat, but it, and actually his body could go wherever it pleased with neither walls nor distance as an obstacle. That's pretty cool. It was the same body he had before he died because his friends recognized him, right, on the road to Emmaus, etc. But it was a different enough body that they did not recognize him at first sight. What will we do there in heaven? The answer to this is simple. We'll do God's will. In the model prayer, Yeshua taught us how to pray. He said, your will be done on earth, what? As it is in heaven. In heaven, we'll do whatever Adonai wants. It won't be boring. There'll be praise and worship. In Revelation chapters 4 and 5, we are seen around the throne of the Lamb singing praises, probably in a minor key. Just saying. But we won't be singing praises for eternity as some people posit or think. There will be much to do as we worship God and do His will. Worship involves, how many of you know, so much more than praise. Worship is honoring and obeying the Lord. Bottom line, I think we're going to spend eternity fulfilling two basic directives. April, if you'd come up. God has given us to follow here on earth. Two basic directives. Love God and love others. So get ready to spend an eternity loving God supremely and loving your brothers and loving your sisters there. Finally, final question. What does heaven look like? Well, which heaven are you talking about? The present heaven is where departed Yeshua followers are now. 
But after Yeshua returns, Revelation chapter 20 says there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And I think that all the things that Adonai created are going to be there, which includes animals, includes nature, but it will be a new earth as Adonai originally intended without the stain of sin. What kind of perfect environment, close your eyes for a moment, what kind of perfect environment do you picture when you think about what heaven's going to be like? Well, maybe some of us, like myself, love the beach. My picture, I might picture a perfect beach front with no trash, no litter, no rip currents, no sharks, no crabs, no seaweed, right? No, it's better than that. If you're a golfer, any golfers? You're not a golfer. Are you a golfer? I learn something new every week from you. You might picture being able to play or Yolanda picture. I can't picture Yolanda playing, but, but she says she's a golfer. She's picturing herself playing in Augusta National and every drive just splits the fairway and every putt rattles into the cup. That's Yolanda. I don't believe it at all, but, it's, but she's saying it. But it's better than that, Yolanda. It's better than that, better than splitting the fairway, better than rattling the cup at Augusta. You know, how many of you love to hike? A lot of you do. Picture Close your eyes, that perfect mountain trail with no briars, no snakes. And you don't get tired as you carry that hundred pound pack uphill on your back. No, it's better than that. Imagine what you can, and it's better than that. We spend so much time imagining what heaven will be like. And then we think we just can't comprehend how wonderful it will be. Actually, we don't have to use our imagination. Paul quoted from Isaiah when he wrote this. He said this, quote, Things no eye has seen and no ear has heard that have not entered the heart of mankind. These things God has prepared for those who love him. And that's where we usually stop reading. And so we think, I just can't understand how great heaven's going to be. But we keep reading on in that verse in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. But God revealed these things to us through the Spirit. That's exciting. If you'd stand with me today. Straight up noon. My friends, heaven should thrill us and excite us. It should be the desire of every one of us to speak spend eternity there and my favorite thing about heaven is what Yeshua said on the last page of the Brit Chadashah scriptures in Revelation 21 5 behold I am making all things new it's all going to be new and improved <laughs> a new and improved earth a new and improved heaven and most importantly a new and improved you and me is heaven real? You bet. And I hope we'll surrender our lives to Yeshua if we haven't done that. If you're listening on the podcast, you need to do that so that you'll spend eternity there as well. We want to take as many people there as we can in our lives. Father, we thank you and praise you for your word today and for time of praise, time of worship, time of encouraging our brother and sister in Yeshua. I want to lift up the outreach going on at 2 o'clock today down in Balboa Park. We want to lift up those who are traveling today, those who are ill and at home today. We continue to pray the resurrection power of Yeshua runs in and through your lives. And as God told Moses how to tell Aaron, how to bless the sons and daughters of Israel, he said, do it like this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May Adonai lift up his countenance over you and grant you peace. In the name of the Sar Shalom, the Prince of all peace, Yeshua of Nazareth, who gave the knockout blow. In his name we pray. Amen. Be amen. Shalom, everybody. Shavuotov.